I will now uh, go on and introduce today's speaker. So we have uh, Professor Sahid Hassan from Princeton. It's, it's a great pleasure to have you here. It's, it's really nice that you accepted our invitation. Um, let me briefly introduce, introduce uh, Professor Hassan to those of you who haven't heard of him. So uh, his background is in, in uh, um, well, he, he did his PhD in Stanford, 2002, working at the SLAC, the Stanford National Accelerator Laboratory, and the Brookhaven National Lab, uh, looking at things like charge dynamics with high-energy X-rays and, uh, and, and that sort of stuff. And then subsequently, he was a Robert H. Dickey Fellow for, in Fundamental Physics at Princeton, and had several extended visits at the Bell Labs and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, before he joined the faculty at, at Princeton University. And I think he has been there ever since. And since 2017, he holds the Eugene Higgins professorship at Princeton University. Uh, Professor Hassan's research is focused on fundamental condensed matter physics, either searching for or in depth exploration of novel cases of electronic matter. And you must have heard or read his work on. For example, topological insulators, including the classic papers on bismuth antimony and bismuth selenide, where uh, they used uh, angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy to directly visualize the topological surface states. Uh, his group has also led the way in search for many other topological systems, including, for example, topological semimetals. And they have made numerous important contributions, topics such as topological magnets, topological superconductors. Kagome materials. Uh, they typically use angle resolved, uh, either normal or spin resolved, angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy, and, and also some of, them, some of their recent work, uh, STM and scanning tunneling spectroscopy, to study these, these, um, these topological phases of matter. And the title of this talk today is Topological Quantum Matter and the New Frontiers. So, we very much look forward to your talk and, and please, the floor is yours. I think you are still muted, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to, uh, to be presenting our results here. Thank you, Peter and others for organizing this colloquium series. So I am going to talk about uh, some recent developments on topological quantum matter, mostly focusing on uh, topological magnets. So the talk is organized in a way that I will introduce, since this is a very broad audience, I will probably one third or one quarter of my talk is a broad introduction to topological quantum matter including an overview of why this field is interesting and what is the future ahead and uh, with a, mostly with a focus on topological magnets. Okay, so last 10 years or so, we have seen three dimensional materials, bulk materials finding, uh, ident being identified as uh, their, uh, finding their topological uh, variants. So I, I remember even 10 years back when I used to teach uh, uh, current matter physics and uh, current matter concepts, uh, we would tell students it's about it's about metals, uh, insulators, magnets, superconductors, and their symmetry broken or symmetry related uh, phases. But in last 10 years or so, clearly. Uh, we have seen examples where the symmetry broken or symmetry related classification alone uh, doesn't work. And there are phases of matter uh, that you cannot identify, uh, for example, entirely insulating or entirely conducting. So the first such example in three dimension is the topological insul 3D topological insulators. And then the research on 3D topo topological materials led to realization of a number of other uh, related phases of matter. So this includes uh, topological variants of magnets like churn magnets or uh, Gagume magnets, topological semimetals, Dirac vial semimetals, and a number of candidate topological superconductors. And uh, so this, uh, uh, so uh, 
one broad distinction is that how do we know something is topological in this very broad sense? Uh, the, the distinction is that there is some sort of, some form of bulk boundary correspondence in the sense that if something is a trivial insulator, it's insulating in the bulk, insulating in the surface, uh, but a, say a topological insulator, it's insulating in the bulk, but it's a guaranteed conductor in some special way on the surface. For example, the surface of a 3D topologi topological insulator, it's conducting, but it's conducting in a special way, in a specially protected way. Uh, in, the, in one example, it's, uh, the conduction is through helical Dirac fermions, their spin momentum law. Similarly, for magnets, semi-metals, or superconductors, there is a boundary mode signature of the bulk topology. So why uh, uh, the techniques of angle resolved photoemission spectroscopy or STM, uh, tunneling spectroscopy, these techniques work so well in this field has to do with the fact that they're, especially for ARPES, it's, uh, it's surface, heavily surface sensitive, uh, as well as by going to higher photon energies, you can also uh, gain bulk sensitivity. So you can probe both the bulk and the surface and see the contrast. The fact that you can see this contrast allows you to check for the, look for the bulk boundary correspondence, uh, which is uh, the mathematical, uh, on which the math mathematical definition of topology uh, is based on. If you talk to a mathematician, they will tell you topology, the signature of topology is in this bulk boundary correspondence. So this is, uh, this is I believe is, is a, uh, is, is the key reason why these techniques work so well in identifying topological states of matter. Okay, so um, uh, Matt, uh, let me start out thanking my students and collaborators. Uh, and this is a collective effort of my entire groups and a number of collaborators uh, within US and around the world. So uh, I'm going to be, the, from the technique side, I'm going to be talking uh, mostly about STM, ARPES, and little bit of theory that is uh, done uh, within our group. We, uh, my group is funded for all three uh, of these uh, efforts. So the, uh, uh, the, the new results I will be presenting are mostly the effort of Ilya Belopolsky, Suyang Zhu, Jiaxinin, Goqing Chan, Sonia Zheng, and Wang Bian. And, and uh, our samples are uh, from Ramon Shankar, Fen Cheng Chou, uh, 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 Cheng Long Zhang, Shuang Zia, Nitin Samarth, and some, some of the samples from Claudia Felser and Hon, Hon, uh, Wen Hong Wang. We use number of facilities, mostly at LBL. I'm also affiliated with LBL as a visitor, visiting scientist there. Uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, uh, Brookhaven, and also Swiss Light Source at PSI, with a number of uh, li a long list of collaborators. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a conceptual uh, introduction, uh, uh, also covering the history of topological phases of matter. I think the fun started with the quantum Hall effect in 1980, that if you take a two-dimensional electron system uh, or a very thin metal type of thing, very clean, apply a magnetic field, you get um, Landau quantization. You get the uh, quantization of orbits. Uh, and, uh, and, and then you create a gap, depending on the Fermi level, you create a gap in the sample. So in other words, in the presence of a strong magnetic field, the metal become, can become an insulator, but this is a special kind of insulator that, uh, that it can have boundary conduction, conduction through the edge, this uh, skipping orbit scenario. So the energy momentum representation of this quantum Hall physics, integer quantum Hall physics, is that you have a bulk gap uh, between the valence and conduction band. And then there is a boundary mode in one, di one dimension. There's a chiral edge state. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it propagates in only one direction. So in other words, 
uh, in the k plus direction, there is a state, but there's no k minus. So this is the energy momentum dispersion relation of the uh, electrons in the quantum Hall state. So, uh, and this quantum Hall state is described by a single topological invariant. This is the Chern number and which, which is a special, I, I'll, I'll talk about invariants lit, uh, technically a little more in the next slide, but uh, for now let's just uh, stick to it that this is the, this 2D topological insulator uh, the quantum hull, integer quantum hull state is a, uh, a topological state described by a single topological invariant, the Chern number or TKNN invariant. Now, uh, uh, since then, I think even in the 80s, people started to think about Haldane, for example, my colleague at Princeton, uh, started to think about whether without a magnetic field, uh, uh, you can create some sort of, by the band structure alone, you can create a churn number in the system. So, so that's the uh, well-known Haldane model or uh, quantum anomalous Hall state. And then if you take two copies of Haldane model at spin orbit, you get a quantum spin Hall state, the kane milli state. Uh, so these are all in some sense variant or combination of the integer quantum Hall state. So the, so the energy momentum relation in this case, uh, because now you don't have magnetic fields, so nothing is breaking time reversal. So then you should have a time reversal invariant band structure, uh, time reversal invariant state. So you just, the, you achieve that by adding uh, by combining two integer quantum Hall state uh, spin up and down. So then you have uh, uh, right-handed chiral edge state and then left-handed chiral edge state uh, spin selective, right? So then if in an energy momentum dispersion relation, you get a, a, a crossing and this crossing is protected by the, by also by a single invariant. In this case, it's the Z2 invariant which depends on the parity of the eigenfunctions and uh, state. So then uh, from a dispersion relation point of view, and this can be achieved in the presence of spin orbit, the relativistic term in the band structure naturally presents. So you have to look for those uh, insulators in the heavy uh, elemental solids. Uh, okay, so then this crossing is protected and the low energy excitations around this crossing will follow the Dirac equation. Uh, so this is how Dirac fermion and all that uh, start, uh, st uh, started to appear in uh, topological physics. That was not in the 80s. In the quantum Hall physics people are not talking Dirac fermion in the 80s, but with the spin orbit 2D topological insulator, the uh, Dirac equation became relevant. So then once you have the Dirac re experimental realization of Dirac fermions, then uh, much of the QFT uh, quantum field theory effects can be realized in solid. So that was the beginning of the fun. Uh, but then uh, this is, uh, the QFT is much richer in 3, 3D or higher dimension like string theorists know that very well. So, uh, but the question is, is there a, a uh, higher dimensional topological insulator that's not an analog, that's not a uh, simple stacking combination of the 2D state. Meaning that is there a richer topological, new topological state in higher dimension, which is not uh, described by a single invariant. For example, if you take a 2D topological insulator of any of this kind, and you stack them in the third dimension, then this edge state that is that leaves on the edge or the boundary, they will also stack. So you, the edge state will become a surface state of the side surface, but there will be nothing on the top and bottom surface, right? So in other words, this will still be described by that 3D version of a uh, version created out of 2D topological insulators will still be described from topology point of view by a single invariant. But in 3D, it turns out that uh, intrinsically there is a new topological state, which is not a stacking or linear combination of uh, uh, 2D topological insulators. So this is the, uh, where you can also have a Dirac, 2D Dirac cone on the top and bottom surface, not only on the side surfaces. 
And on all surfaces, the, uh, there will be an odd number of Dirac, uh, uh, or Dirac fermion, at least to the least. So, so this 3D topological insulator is, is a new state uh, because it's described by multiple invariants. And this is, uh, this is also, this also uh, there's a historical bit is that why uh, uh, the uh, uh, quantum Hall disappeared from the 3D topological state because there's no quantum Hall effect anymore. It's a new state. So a new term had to be coined. So often there is a uh, misunderstanding that it's just a 3D version of the 2D state. In, it, it's much richer than that. It's a new state. And that is now, once the 3D topological insulator was discovered, uh, then uh, if everything in 2D uh, in lower dimension were named after that. Before that, it was all fun because there's always some sort of quantum Hall effect associated with these things. Uh, but here there is no quantum Hall effect uh, in the transport sense. So this creates, this is a new beast. So this creates, um, uh, this makes it necessary to create, uh, come up with experimental techniques to study it. So, uh, uh, so uh, as I said, that uh, the 2D topological state is described by a turn number or a Z2 invariant. Uh, which has some sort of transport realization. But the, in 3D, there are four topological invariants. So that means in 3D, there are uh, 15 plus one distinct insulator. And of them, 15 are topological, all in different ways. So how do you do that? How do you experimentally uh, identify that? So this is a new challenge uh, because now the transport community cannot access that sort of thing because these invariants do not come something like a transport uh, quantities uh, prefactor or uh, some transport coefficient. So these invariants also do not necessarily lead to uh, quantized transport. So, but these invariants are, they are related to the wave function electron degrees of freedom uh, our electronic wave function. So, uh, so the so our solution to the problem, or our the way we address this issue, this theoretical theoretical experimental issue, is that uh, these invariants eventually they are they are made up of all the degrees of freedom electrons can have, meaning that energy, momentum, all the quantum numbers it can have, the energy, momentum, and spin. So if we can decisively uniquely image energy momentum spin on the edge and on the bulk and see how the contrast and then how they connect, then we have established what mathematicians call bulk boundary correspondence uh, uh, identifying topology. So our experiments are directly uh, tied to the, uh, to the topology itself. So I'm not, I don't want to give an impression that there is no uh, response function uh, aspect of it. Uh, yes, there is response function, for example, but it can only give you one invariant, the first invariant. So you can do magnitude electric uh, uh, response and then uh, watch its quantization. And that, that is one way, uh, uh, one way of finding one invariant, but these rest of the invariants, uh, there is no response function uh, connection to this invariant. So, so it's only spectroscopy that can give you a complete description of the topo 3D topological state. So now going back to the, uh, to the first slide I showed that why uh, my techniques have been so successful in identifying topological states is, 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 is rooted in that bulk boundary correspondence. So this is all these uh, are spectroscopic images that decisively prove those invariants. So I'll give you one example before I move to the new result aspect of my colloquium. So before I uh, even do that, I uh, want to say that in doing so, it, this, is, this has been a long journey. It's not a simple task. Uh, and we, the, the methodology, the technology, and the subroutines within ARPES, ARPES existed 
even before Einstein, even Einstein got his Nobel Prize for uh, photoelectric effect. Uh, but what is new is that we had to uh, realign the technique, uh, introducing various subroutines, methodology, or instrumentation algorithm to, uh, uh, to probe the topological states decisively. And that uh, development happened over the last 15 years or so. And I'm not going to uh, mention those things in detail. Uh, if you're interested, you can find it in my website or you can find it, part of it is in my review uh, uh, in Modern Physics uh, 2010. This review is actually two third about these things. Very little theory is there. So uh, although it's cited by both theorists and experimentalists, but it's mostly an experimental review. Okay, so the first example, which will align you to the type of thing we are doing. So we are uh, shooting photons and uh, taking electrons out, measuring its energy, energy and momentum uh, in different directions. So if we do that uh, on, on, the, on some of the bismuth compounds that we have uh, uh, probed uh, in the early days, uh, we can uh, we can in situ prepare this to lie the firm, to keep the Fermi level inside the bulk gap of this material. So it's uh, so we can only probe the surface state. And then when we look at the spin, we see that the if k plus is uh, spin down, k minus is up. And uh, so there is this is true for any diagonal cuts across the Fermi surface. And there is only one non-degenerate Fermi surface on the surface. And uh, there is no uh, second Fermi surface in the interbrian zone, meaning that it's not Rajba. Rajba uh, uh, comes with a pair. So uh, now uh, we, can, we can also probe this at any, by placing Fermi level anywhere in the gap or by just imaging the whole thing if it is, uh, if the, state is below the Fermi level. So, and then we can image the spin texture at each energy. And we see that above the Dirac node in this material, there's a chirality change, momentum space chirality change of the spin texture. So this suggests that this, this, is, a, this is a non-degenerate line of different uh, or character. So then, um, uh, and then at the Dirac node, there is uh, zero DOS, there's, uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this is a spin degenerate case. So one way to interpret this is that we consider uh, a k plus moving to the meaning moving to the right, spin down, k minus moving to the left, and that's all the degrees of freedom we have in this uh, surface. So how do we know? Uh, so how so if you think of how much the phase is carried by electrons being transported by such a Fermi surface. So we, we can think of it that like we take a spin and uh, wind it by 360 degree. And uh, so the spin being a spin half, of, electron being a spin half object, uh, it, uh, uh, you need to move it, uh, rotate it by 720 degrees. So, so that means we have half the uh, rotation here. So that means the uh, Betty phase here is pi. So the topological invariant in this case is uh, Betty phase divided by pi, so it's one. So this is, that means the topological invariant is non-zero, it's one. So if you would have a Rashba type of thing, you have another thing, then you would have two pi, then uh, so invariant would be this mod two, so then that would be zero. So this tells us that this is topological and this is one way of measuring topological invariant. So, uh, so, uh, so then we can do that for, uh, we see that this is true, the invariant or very phase is pi, as long as you are inside the gap, as once you are outside the gap, uh, it's not uh, well defined. So that means the throughout the gap, surface is conducting uh, and the Dirac fermions carry pi very phase and they're all always spin momentum locked. So the consequence of spin momentum locking is that now the U-turn is not possible. 
uh, electron, let's say if you can find on the surface, on the, um, say on the edge, uh, the, which we can probe with STM, then, then the K minus electron trying to take a U-turn is not possible. This upstate is not allowed here. So that means the backscatter, absence of backscattering, which can also be probed by uh, STM directly by looking at uh, QPI. So that means the uh, uh, backscattering is forbidden as long as time reversal symmetry is not broken, okay? So another interesting thing about uh, these materials, we found that uh, the, uh, these material, these, this, all these topological properties I described so far, they all survive up to room temperature. So then, uh, so then these are, uh, for, I would say these are first observation ever of topological electronic phenomena at room temperature without magnetic field. So, so this is quite a bit of contrast with respect to the quantum Hall uh, community is that uh, where the physics is, topological physics is confined at low temperature and high field. So now with the observation of room temperature, spin momentum locking and pi very phase and helical spin texture, it, it gives you a first clear evidence that this type of topology survives without magnetic field at room temperature. So why is this? Uh, this this may not be surprising for theorists, but it's interesting for experimentalists because now, uh, if you don't have to uh, deal with magnetic field, you can do a lot of other things. Uh, especially uh, uh, find its way to uh, potential application device applications. You need to be operating at room temperature and uh, having magnetic field is problematic. So no magnetic, no zero magnetic field room temperature uh, effects are uh, the first step toward application. Okay, so, so uh, shortly after those demonstration, the, there are a lot of follow up work um, and much of condensed matter physics was happening on this topological insulators like magnetism, uh, quantum hall. You can then look at the quantum hall effect of the surface electron gas, uh, superconductivity, topological phase transition, all of that was happening, uh, condo physics. So uh, both in theory and experiments. And now you can see that this is my slide from 2011, it's 10 years ago. So uh, so you can see that uh, uh, this, this this uh, topological materials in 3D, it really opened up the field for wide ranging studies. So what is even beyond that? Why, uh, so I'll focus two aspects which keeps, uh, uh, keeps moving forward further, keeps moving forward further. So one exciting thing is once you have a uh, isolated Dirac fermion, which was not possible, which is not there in graphene because graphene uh, has four Dirac fermions. Or, uh, so topological insulator surface is like one quarter of graphene. So you have an isolated Dirac fermion, single Dirac fermion. Th that's exciting because then, uh, as I said in the beginning, then you can uh, realize many QFT related effects, many other solutions to the Dirac, form, uh, Dirac equation. Uh, prominent ones are the half fermions. So for example, vile fermion or Majorana fermion. So one can in QFT uh, or Dirac equation, one can think of uh, Dirac fermion as a pair of vile fermion. It's a very simple construction. You can uh, decompose. So, so you can say that a pair of uh, opposite chirality vile fermions make up a Dirac fermion. Um, and uh, you can also think of Marana as uh, those are the, uh, when you have, uh, when you seek or look for real solution to the Dirac equation, then uh, those half fermions are Marana. And uh, since you are, uh, these are real number solutions to the Dirac equation where function is real, then your complex conjugate is the same number real. So Maharana is its own antiparticle, is uh, having real wave function. So much of the uh, uh, subsequent research from topological insulator Dirac fermion 
um, that we demonstrated uh, opened up research for uh, vile marana and more. I mean, I mentioned other things, but these are the two uh, directions of research that keeps moving forward. So, uh, uh, so for the rest of my talk, uh, my group is working on all these aspects, all these things, uh, but I will mostly talk about what is happening in topological magnetism and, or even what is topological magnetism, okay? So one way to realize a topological magnet, at least in 2D, is to magnetize a, uh, magnetize a topological insulator, meaning that a break time reversal, if you break time reversal, then the protection is lost. Z2 invariant is uh, based on time reversal. So this is what we were doing back in 2008. And this is shortly after reviewed in my paper with Kane, 2010, we were magnetizing on the surface and also on the bulk uh, to break Dirac fermions to create parabolic band, create a massive Dirac fermion uh, to create a mass gap in the system. So this, proof to be complicated for experimental and also surface chemistry reason. So then we had to figure out which of these gaps are uh, really uh, 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 topology related. Are these gaps topological? So then we had to introduce, as I mentioned, we introduced a number of experimental algorithms, including instruments, how to do this. So, uh, so we come up with a combination of techniques that can uh, tell you whether this gap is um, topological or not. So the goal is, uh, yes, the magnetism, when you put, do put magnetic impurities, it can create a topological gap, but it can also create extrinsic or non-topological gap. So the experimental challenge is how to identify when you created the topological gap. So one thing uh, you can start out doing is that uh, if you observe a gap on the same sample, do a, a dichroic experiment, circular dichroism, and see whether there is dichroic signal and also that whether there is hysteresis uh, on this uh, sample. Uh, and then the, uh, whether this magnetization disappears at some higher temperature and the gap all should also close. So these are uh, the, uh, the first order diagnostic, but then we, uh, we found that in some samples, it's even more complicated. You need more subtle, more detailed diagnostic. So then we, we, we uh, started to probe the spin texture around the spectral weight suppression gap-like feature. So then we see that uh, the spin texture is really found that it's really uniquely tied to magnetism because without uh, local or global time reversal breaking, the uh, microscopically bre uh, uh, creating a, uh, a spin texture, non-trivial spin texture is very un uh, unlikely. Uh, so, uh, so then we demonstrated that if you have a extrinsic gap for many reasons, it could be surface chemistry reason, then this will not disrupt the spin texture, it will uh, in, uh, at the edge of the gap. Uh, here are two examples where that uh, it can happen. But if you do have a topological gap, it will create a hedgehog type spin texture at the edge of the gap. And this uh, should also disappear as you raise temperature um, uh, uh, back uh, across the transition. A further diagnostic uh, to be, to be uh, um, absolutely sure, we uh, gated the sample to have create an insulating magnetic gap, uh, insulating magnetic state, meaning a Fermi level in the gap, and then uh, track very phase tunability, how the very phase is collapsing. Uh, so we use NO2 for surface gating. And then we demonstrated that this hedgehog spin texture is really the signature of a churn gap. Uh, um, uh, and there are other spin texture that can, uh, that are other ways of creating gap, but this is not non-magnetic. Tunneling gap, for example, this is non-magnetic. This uh, spin texture is a, a distinct signature. For example, if you place your Fermi level here, you'll see a spin polarized surface Fermi surface, 
here you don't you will not get a spin polarized from the surface even though there is a gap here okay so with that diagnostic we uh, we started to think how to how to apply this technology or this set of experimental ideas to probe a uh, topological gap in other systems so one uh, suggestion a theoretical suggestion I had from my friend Shu Chang Zhang uh, during a workshop at Banff, uh, where, where something we co uh, Shu Chang and I co organized. He had this paper in PRL uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect in Kagome lattice flat band material. So, this, this material. So, Shu Chang suggested me to work on this material. We worked on this, but then it, it, it this material is very hard to work with, and we could not find any. Uh, signal on that. So then we started to think what would be an analogous material, say in the same electronic space group that has similar features, uh, the Kagome lattice features, meaning that you have a flat band and at the K point you have a Dirac point. And then if you have magnetism, out of plane magnetism MC, then this will create a topological gap, a churn gap. So so this was our transition from churn magnetism, identifying churn gap, topological gap, uh, and then applying it to Kagome lattice. Uh, this pa theory paper uh, connected the two uh, and Zhang suggested me to work on this. So then uh, if this material doesn't work very well, then we, uh, my student, Jashin In, he, uh, he was my, he came to me as a postdoc with this idea, he's a friend of one of the co-authors in Zhang's paper uh, in the Chinese world. And he uh, uh, wanted to study this iron-teen materials. Uh, he came to my lab uh, and then, uh, so the idea here is that this is a very complicated material system. How do we know that we are looking at the Kagome bands because there it's not just Kagome, this the ideal thing, but there are other things. How do you identify? So then his idea, Jashin's idea was that, let's do STM. Uh, then we can, uh, we'll sometimes cleave on the Kagome plane and non-Kagome plane, we'll create a contrast because STM is extremely surface sensitive. So, but, so in other words, we he did the first Kagome resolve measurement on these compounds. This is published in Nature uh, in 2008. This uh, same year, a little bit earlier than us, there's also transport result by Tchaikovsky, uh, but the transport result suffers from that same problem. Which this compound has many, many bands. How do you know you're actually probing Kagome band? So this is what Joshin demonstrated that uh, by uh, exfoliating or cleaving, you can probe identify Kagome band. So, so one, one surprising thing we found that this material um, uh, you, in a Kagome system, you would think it's sixfold, but it actually uh, uh, STM shows that QPI pattern shows that it's twofold. And, uh, and then when you apply a field in plane field, then uh, we, the, the twofold axis rotates with the field. So, so in other words, uh, and with STM, we can see that it's not lattice that is twofold because we can do topography STM. Uh, and then when you apply a very strong field out of plane, the six fold uh, electronic uh, structure reappears. So that means there is a strong demati, electronic pneumaticity in the system. Uh, electronic, finding electronical in pneumatic system is not new in condensed matter, but what is new or the first, here is that uh, finding a system where you can control the pneumatic axis with an external field. So this is the first example of a pneumatic system that you can control with a uh, uh, magnetic field. So in other words, clearly we were just looking for uh, Chan gap and Kagome physics uh, in the Chan gap topological gap system, but we found more because uh, we found many body effects here. Uh, but as I said, this material has too many bands and it's too complicated to isolate, uh, explore Kagome physics or topological physics. So this is a time I want to review a little bit what was happening by other groups in the uh, kind of the 
brief history of the field, the topological magnetism in 2D, uh, we first demonstrated this topological gap, churn magnetism through spectroscopy on manganese dope bismuth TIs, but the edge states are not accessible to experiment. Landau level not resolved in transport. We just saw the gap, there is a churn gap, but we could not do more. Uh, and then a year later, uh, chromium dope bismuth based TIs, uh, uh, Chikun Shue group in um, uh, Tsinghua, they observe quantum anomalous Hall state uh, at very low temperature, but the churn gap is very small, like a millivolt or sub millivolt. So you cannot do spectroscopy or any more detail or anything. So uh, you just see uh, quantum anomalous Hall quantization, but you don't learn more uh, beyond that. Uh, so in 2018, uh, then we observed this churn gap using spin um, STM spin Q QPI, but the edge states are not accessible. Anomalous Hall effects in, in transport by the MIT group, they also did not, they did not find edge state or Landau quantization, any of that thing. Uh, but finding edge state is important to prove topology, as I said, in the, the bulk boundary correspondence. So that was the status of the field. So then uh, at that point, the goal was to identify or make a 2D churn magnet in the quantum limit where edge states are accessible, Landau levels accessible and churn gap is large, ideally more than 25 millivolts so that you can have room temperature operation. As I said, in the 3D topological insulator, we showed that this topological effect is uh, uh, possible at room temperature. We want to show that also with the topological magnet. So that means you need a large gap topological magnet and all these accessibility. And also in the interacting limit, there might also be some quantum many body physics like condolatis physics type of thing. So guided by our past experience on decade long experience on topological magnets, uh, we then in 2019 discovered a new churn magnet. It's, uh, it's uh, 166 family. So this 166 uh, family is interesting because it, uh, it is built in, it has a, uh, in the, when you, the rare earth is terbium, it's a built in out of plane magnetism which is not the case with the rest of the compound. And there's another lucky match. Uh, the second lucky match in the system is that it can be prepared extremely clean. Uh, you can see that uh, there's no single defect in this view. And uh, Kagome magnets have been studied by many groups, including us. Uh, so this is all uh, data from my STM lab. Uh, we studied all these other Kagome planes of Kagome magnets, but we can see that you can see that this compound is much cleaner than the rest. So we uh, so we expect that this is um, this is going to be this is going to be the material where you could find more subtle effects, more uh, uh, go deeper. So when you apply a magnetic when we apply the magnetic field, we right away in this very clean sample we see this DOS modulation, very dramatic DOS modulation. As I said, with STM, you can isolate other bands just by, you just cleave on the uh, selectively probe the Kagome layer. And when you look at the non-Kagome layer, we don't see the DOS modulation. So that means this DOS modulation is related to the Kagome layer. So, so that's very interesting. And then when we explore the full detail of the DOS modulation, uh, then we can uh, we look at the spectral line shape. We can start, we see that the, the higher Landau levels are nonlinear, uh, clearly signaling Dirac physics. Uh, as you know, the linear uh, linearity would imply parabolic band. So, so now we can fit this Landau structure, Landau level structure with a massive Dirac fermion uh, quantization rule. And then we can extract the parameters of the system that the, the Fermi level or the Dirac point is 130 millivolt away from, uh, from the, uh, yeah, Dirac, Fermi, uh, Dirac node and Fermi levels are 130 millivolt away. And the gap is 34 millivolts, which is good. So now uh, we can, now, as I said that this is, 
uh, all this is telling us STM here, Landau quantization and nonlinear higher Landau levels, it's telling us this massive Dirac fermion in the system. So we're back to the same question, uh, 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 the, meaning that uh, is this topological, is this gap topological? So how do we resolve this time without ARPES? We, uh, we, we resolved it this time without ARPES by asking this question, okay, if this massive Dirac, if this gap, massive Dirac gap, is topological, then inside the gap, I should be able to see uh, edge state that are chiral. So bringing in bulk boundary correspondence. And indeed, you see that the gap is 130 millivolt away from the Fermi level. And indeed, when we scan across the step edge of the sample, uh, and then we, when your Fermi level is inside the gap, only then we see a chiral edge state. Uh, uh, um, it, it's back that we know this because there's no backscattering here. I can see that uh, only at 130 millivolt it lines, uh, lights up. And this is not an accident because we can also check a side cleave, uh, which remains there. So in other words, uh, it's a remarkable thing that by fitting these data, we extract that this number 130 millivolt, that's a extraction from based on analysis and then we do experiments, go to 130 millivolt, we find the chiral edge mode there. So that means there is this gap is topological. This does not necessarily mean it's in the quantum limit. Uh, so, but now that we can, uh, we know the microscopic parameters, we can uh, drive it to the quantum limits. Uh, so this is also consistent with anomalous Hall transport. If we fit anomalous Hall transport, uh, we also get a 34 millivolt gap and 130 millivolt uh, shift of the Fermi level. And this is a remarkable agreement between STM and transport. So this is the advantage of doing a spectroscopy that uh, unlike in the transport, you just see quantum anomalous Hall effect, but you don't know the microscopic. Uh, it's, uh, here is that since we know the microscopic, how to further engineer the system to bring it to perfection, bring it to room temperature. So you can drive it to the, you know which way to dope or um, how much to do uh, in, to engineer the band structure further to take it to the quantum level. So this is work in progress, but at least we have a baseline system that we hope that we can achieve in the next few years, a room temperature topological magnet which can be the basis of future, um, some sort of device. Okay, so now switching gear to 3D. So 3D, uh, our work in 3D, uh, search for 3D topological magnet uh, uh, it also goes back to churn gap measurement. Uh, how do we know, how do we measure a churn gap in momentum space so that uh, that is uh, the question we're asking back in 2010, 11. Uh, in 2012, we even uh, predicted a vial material, the vial were, appears in the title of this paper. So uh, in 2011, we have the science paper, Su Yang Zhu, where we probe, showed that how do you go from topological insulator to a band insulator, even if you have spin orbit. So there's a band inversion transition. So the gap will close at some point, it will create a 3D Dirac fermion. So you go through a 3D Dirac semi-metal phase. Uh, so then once you have a 3D Dirac, then as I said, then finding vial is just breaking symmetry. So in 2013, I assigned my students uh, and postdocs uh, these projects that, okay, take our idea in this paper, magnetize the Dirac critical point. That's a Dirac semi-metal. If you break Dirac, uh, break symmetry of a Dirac critical point, you'll get bile fermion. And I asked my postdocs to magnetize these other compounds, the bismuth antimony, for example, it also has a Dirac critical point. And Suyan Zhu and Ilya Belopolsky, I asked them to search in the database to find I broken inversion broken materials, which would be analog of this physics. So it turned out doing this type of material science is, is complicated and the gap 
you can open a gap, but it's too small for ARPES to solve. So then I broken materials uh, work better because then the gap is large. So, so what is the idea Suyang and Ilya used is, is uh, shown in this in our theory paper that if you start with a 3D topological insulator, so a Fermi surface, you close the gap in two points. So now uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's that Dirac critical point. But then now if you break symmetry, the Dirac can only break into pile. So that will lead to Fermi arc construction, right? So, 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 so our uh, finding of while Fermion is through our earlier work, based on our earlier work on 3D topological insulator. And this is how we discovered this class of materials. And then uh, when we demonstrate this thing, we did not use our own theory, although we calculated band structure and all that. We used uh, experiment only method to prove that this is what we did with all other topological, most other topological materials without referring to the theory, just by looking at the experiment, can we see something very unusual? And can we interpret in, in terms of broad physics? So our idea was that, okay, we'll probe the surface and we see this arc-like features and we'll take a loop cut in momentum space. That loop cut, uh, then if you look in the energy axis, then we, we, it looks very strange because it, they have no counterpart. They are like chiral edge modes, they co-propagate. If they co-propagate, then that is a very, very strange thing because no one has seen such a thing in ARPAS ever. So these chiral edge modes, and then- uh, Sorry, five minutes. Yeah, 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 thank you. So then, uh, so, so that means we see chiral edge modes. And then when we look at the bulk, uh, with high photon energy, you can also just ignore the surface and see the bulk. And then we see the Fermi surface, effective Fermi surface is at like two points. So that means the bulk Fermi surface is like two points. And then when you do energy, look down in, this is Kx, Ky. If you look down in energy, you see that those are the tip of those two points. Down in energy, you see that those are like a split Dirac cone. And then when you, we do a spin on this, we see that they're non-degenerate. So that means that there was a Dirac cone uh, in some uh, material parameter space. And then when you broke the symmetry, the Dirac uh, split into vial, a pair of vial. Now these are non-degenerate. So this is, uh, now we want to put this chiral H mode, co-propagating chiral H mode and uh, split Dirac cone uh, into a single picture by doing experiment alone again. So this is what we did. We put low energy ar uh, ARPES, which probes the surface, we see arc-like thing. And then we do high energy ARPES, we see bulk-like thing. In high energy ARPES, we see dots. In the low energy arcs, we see arcs. So then it looks like uh, within the resolution of ARPES, these arcs terminate where the bulk nodes are, while nodes are. So this is our, proof of bulk boundary correspondence that, that, uh, uh, that the surface arc terminates uh, where the bile, node, uh, bile nodes are. So you can see that in all my data, I did not make any comparison with band calculation, even though we showed band calculation in our theory paper. So, so our experiments are independent of calculation, just by experiment alone, can we prove something? So, uh, uh, and then when you do spin, then we see that these uh, nodes are kind of like case space monopole or anti-monopole type of thing. I, I, I don't have time to get into that. So, so our first Fermi arc paper appeared in 2014 um, online in December. This established the method how to find arc and uh, vile Fermion. And then, uh, and then shortly, a few months after, we had the full paper in, uh, also in science in 2015, same first author, sometimes these two paper gets mixed because of that. And then subsequently there are other groups doing other things like there's photonic, bosonic crystal, but there is no vile fermion here in the MIT paper. There's no vile fermion in, um, uh, Chinese paper either. 
to just do study from here using the method we established a year earlier. Okay, but uh, now by now many groups have reconfirmed uh, what we have done uh, using the methods we introduced. Okay, so uh, since I don't have a lot of time, I'll, I'll uh, cut to the chase. So, um, uh, but then we, the, the mission uh, unaccomplished because we, what we were searching is how to find a 3D topological magnet, like we found a 2D topological magnet. So then we, based on the ideas we introduced on the vile semi-metals, then we figured where to find a magnetic uh, vile semi-metal. So we theoretically predicted uh, using ideas from topological half and chain link, this is our theory paper, that where to find one. And then we, uh, then we do a detailed band mapping. Uh, I don't have time to go over that, but then we come to this conclusion that it does have a magnetic vile loop and then the magnetic vile loops are connected through uh, surface drumhead states. Uh, the line nodes are connected by surface drumhead states. How do you know this a drumhead? We map it all over case space and we know their energy, photon energy non-dispersive, meaning the KZ dispersion is zero. As we change photon energy, we probe the K sub Z axis and it doesn't move. Their, their, non their wave function is 2D. Okay, so then, uh, so that gives our bulk boundary correspondence for a 3D topological magnet. Uh, finally, we also want to make a connection to transport. Okay, so now I showed all these bands. How do you, why should you believe me? How, how do you know, or how do, I, how do I know that I did not miss a band? In a multiband system, it can happen. In spectroscopy, you could miss a band. So I, I devised a test here. I said, okay, so let's take the 3D uh, Fermi surface of this system and fit, uh, it take the parameters to optimize the DFT uh, uh, calculations. I mean, the DFT modeling. If we know that, then we can, once we optimize that, we use that set of parameters to calculate the Benny curvature field. So this is my Berry curvature field map. Now, once I have Berry curvature field map, which is taken directly from ARPES, uh, now, and also from ARPES, I know the, where is the Fermi level. If I have Berry curvature field map, I can calculate topological transport, like anomalous Hall transport or anything that depends on Berry curvature field. So this is what we did. We predicted, okay, so if this is the ARPES result, um, then the anomalous Hall uh, conductivity would be uh, about 1,900 or so, given the ARPES Fermi surface here. It's off the Berry curvature singularity in this compound, okay? So uh, subsequent to our theoretical prediction, uh, ARPES and theoretical prediction, our colleagues, uh, Fausto Manna did the transport measurement and he gave us this number that the anomalous hull conductivity is 870. It's right on within the error margin. So, so this convinced me that the spectroscopy and transport are in agreement because if we would have missed a band, then this will terribly change the Baker curvature field. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll not be able to uh, match up to transport. So this also reflects something that in my group, I'm also setting up to do transport myself. I have a funding for that now. So, uh, so in the next few years or so, we'll do a lot more uh, what I call spectroscopy transport correspondence. I showed you at least two examples, one in the churn, churn magnet uh, transport and spectroscopy match, and also in the 3D uh, vial magnet. So I think, a lot of exciting things are happening with, will be happening with topological magnetism. And uh, we demonstrated 2D churn magnets, Kagome magnets and wild line 3D magnets. And, and as we explore more and more materials, uh, many body effects are naturally showing up uh, unpredicted. For example, nobody predicted this pneumatic um, uh, Kagome magnet or its 
uh, quantum control, field control, which could uh, be uh, could find some device application, and also this uh, have been finding a way to uh, um, use spectroscopy to map the quantum geometry of a uh, quantum material and make connection to transport. So this, these are all exciting new frontiers. I think uh, they're exciting times ahead. So I, I sort of tried to uh, present in a broad overview sense. Uh, presentation was kind of in a broad overview sense because the audience is broad. But if you want to know more deeper technical details, we have a number of review papers that uh, you are welcome to dig into. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so thanks a lot for, for the really nice colloquium. Um, then we have some time, so time for questions. So please, you can either raise your hand or you can type it in the, in the chat. Um, hi, Professor Hassan. So, well, first of all, thanks a lot for the wonderful colloquium. So I wanted to ask you about the vile semi-metals that you showed a, at the very end. Uh, uh, and, and in particular, I wanted to ask you if, uh, let's say, you, it is well understood what happens when you have, let's say, some defects on the surface or the impurities. So what, what is the kind of reconstruction that one gets on the surface states when, when the surface is not completely perfect? Um, as long as uh, the magnetic order, uh, there is a global average magnetic order, I think the surface states will not be affected because the, the, the topological in, in vile magnets, topological state is, uh, magnetic order is essential for the, uh, for keeping the topology in place. Uh, one way to think about it is that if you turn off magnetism, then the splitting will be gone, right? The spin splitting will be gone. So then that's, this will change the band topology and very curvature everything. So my, my, since this is a global state, I think uh, even if you have magnetic impurity on the surface, uh, as long as the global state magnetic order is there, uh, things will be less affected. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, depend, it will depend on uh, the local change of the local property around the impurity. Of, of, uh, of course, so, something will happen. Uh, but as far as topological property is concerned, it, I don't see how to destroy it without destroying global magnetism. Yeah, all right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I, you, you did say it, but maybe I missed it. But so this combination of, let's say, spectroscopy and transport. So what, what exactly is the extra thing you get from the transport experiments? Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, many of this topological thing is related to the Betty curvature uh, uh, field related things, right? And then the very curve uh, transport is transport or say optics and nonlinear optical effects are very strong, really sensitive to some transport and uh, some nonlinear optics are strongly sensitive to very curvature thing. So what I'm trying to say is that since RPES and spin RPES gives you a very detailed map of the band structure and the very curvature or quantum geometry depends on knowing those things, we can take that information to construct a realistic model for the quantum geometry of, a, of any quantum material sample. And then we can then try to predict nonlinear optics. Uh, we, we have, we're be beginning to do that in recent times and, uh, and also transport. Uh, so I'm not saying that I'm trying to do transport and trying to match it the other way. 
so it's more about I, I want to see that. Um, well, I mean, there, there, there's there is some complications as well. For example, if uh, say anomalous hull transport in some magnet is uh, uh, is uh, not non-intrinsic, it could be from e extrinsic things, impurities and uh, other type of uh, non beddy curvature related thing. Then we can tell, okay, so the how much is the beddy curvature? or intrinsic contribution to the anomalous salt transport. But by doing transport alone, I cannot separate that. Yeah, sure. Similarly, with nonlinear optics, by doing nonlinear optics alone, I cannot separate what is intrinsically due to quantum, uh, quantum geometry, what is not. So this is one thing I have in mind that uh, work at the interface to uh, help transport, identify, understand those materials. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. So a broader goal is to fi uh, uh, find materials or optimize or create materials uh, that can operate at room temperature. So as I, as I tried to resonate that, uh, it's possible in uh, uh, in principle. It's possible to do th uh, room temperature three D topological insulators. It's possible to do room temperature uh, vial magnet, like the last one. It, it also operates at room temperature. So that way, the idea is that uh, so that is kind of like stepping stone to find some sort of use of these things in a real device setting. It's a long way off, I know, but uh, but that's that's one of the thing we have in mind. I mean, um, yeah. The other thing is that on the way of exploring this material space, we may uh, encounter things that are uh, many body effect. We don't necessarily they're not uh, described by weak topological concept, weakly interacting topological concept. So. There may be surprise discovery. In fact, I did not present any of that stuff. Uh, if you look at the archive uh, uh, about last uh, 10 of our archive posting is about finding a chiral charge order in a Kagome superconductor. I did not touch on that topic. So that's totally unpredicted, unexpected. So this, uh, in other words, there is some sort of orbital current, uh, extended orbital current that seems to create a magnetics uh, create anomalous hull state, uh, quantum uh, anomalous hull state only in the charge ordered state. And then the, that chiral charge order survives the superconductor. So then uh, that uh, that is also, there may be some intertwining order parameter at low temperature. So there, there, there's a whole lot happening. Um, that's a topic by itself, I did not, talk about that. There, again, that transport spectroscopy correspondence is exploring in a, uh, in a dual mode is, is a really fruitful. So that, that uh, the discovery of chiral charge order in our lab is connected, uh, is, is a um, recent result outcome of that. Um, hi, and uh, if I may, I would like to ask one more question. So regarding, oh, yeah. yes, so regarding this point of uh, room temperature uh, churn insulators in the in the Kagome lattice. Yeah. So is it understood what it's let's say the limiting factor in current materials? So I mean, of course, one needs some specific interplay between exchange coupling and spin orbit coupling. So what, what is it limiting? What is the limiting factor now? Is it spin orbit coupling? Is it the exchange coupling? Or is it more some, let's say, the complex structure of the electronic structure? Yeah, that is a that is a very good question. I think the let me mention something that's peripherally related, not directly answering your question. So what seems to be more serious challenge is that you can find a material, let's say you uh, identify a material based on space group and all that, magnetic space group and all that, and then you do a DFT or first principle calculation, and you find that the churn gap, let's say is large, let's say 30 millivolts. 
there are other material, many, some, a few materials like that, but the main challenge is, is that in many of these materials, there is another band that crossing the Fermi level. So in other words, the gap is not a pure gap. So only a subset of band creates something. So, so the main challenge of finding a room temperature churn magnet operating in transport alone is currently the main challenge is how to clean up, how to engineer the band structure to get rid of the irrelevant bands that uh, make the gap, uh, I mean, the effective gap non-zero. So that's it. And what you asked is a very good question. That optimization, I haven't seen a rigorous theoretical work on that optimization. Uh, now I'm trying to answer your question. That is the question to ask. That is the main key question that how can we optimize it further or what are the parameters that, um, that will give us a more guided search to optimize it to room temperature. That um, I don't think there is a comprehensive theoretical work yet. But the current current limiting factor is is that there is a, a multiband system. There are subset of band that shows a churn gap, or uh, but then other su subset of bands cross from level. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. All right. I, I think there are no more questions. Also, we've gone a little bit over an hour, so I think people have other places to go to. And, and so also, let's thank uh, Professor Hassan once more. It was a great talk.